and the proposition reads, the right way to persuade people of libertarianism is by showing them that its outcomes are superior without any resort to the flawed non-aggression principle. The reader one, the right way to persuade people of libertarianism is by showing them that its outcomes are superior without any resort to the flawed non-aggression principle, the flawed principle. Uh, you see how that uh, adjective is underlined. And uh, two 78-year-old libertarians discussing it, double that, you get 156 years of, of libertarian wisdom grappling with that issue, so this could be your lucky day. I now give, I now give uh, the, uh, the podium over to Dennis Pratt, moderator. Thanks a lot, Gene. In Yiddish, there are twice the number of words for argument than for happy. And so therefore, here on the great Porcupine Freedom Stage, for your entertainment, we bring to you together two great Jewish menches, kvetching for your entertainment. The resolution the right way to persuade people of libertarianism is by showing them that its outcomes are superior by their standards without any resort to the flawed non-aggression principle. In this corner, for the affirmative, a mixed economy practice, uh, oops, sorry, a mixed economist, legal scholar, and anarcho-capitalist, hailing from the authoritarian 49 state of California. <laughs> Weighing in at 78 years of age, David, no, my father wasn't a communist, Friedman. How you doing? Uh, take a seat. And in this corner, for the negative, a mixed economist practitioner running the world-renowned debate series, the Soho Forum, hailing from the authoritarian 49 state of New York City. <laughs> Weighing in also at 78 years of age, Gene, no, my brother's not Jeffrey, Epstein. <laughs> we will start with 17 and a half minutes to establish the case of the resolution with David Friedman. I am going to be making two different arguments. The f Sorry, is this turned on? Yeah. I don't really need a mic in a room this small. Uh, there are two different arguments I have to make. The first is to show what is wrong with the NAP. The second is to show why you do not need the NAP to argue for libertarianism. The NAP, as I understand it and as it's usually presented, is an absolute rule. What it says is you should never initiate coercion. As best I can tell, nobody, including no libertarian, actually believes in it. And my standard example of that, which was invented by the late Bill Bradford, who was the founder and editor of Liberty Magazine, is to imagine that you manage to fall off your 10th floor balcony. By good luck, catch hold of the flagpole of the ninth floor balcony and are working your way hand over hand on back to the balcony when the owner of the apartment comes out and says, you do not have my permission to use my flagpole. <laughs> How many people here, raise your hand if you would let go. 
All right, I think that confirms uh, my claim that nobody actually believes in the NAP as it is normally stated. Uh, a less extreme example that I've sometimes used is to imagine that there is a madman with a rifle shooting at a crowd of people. It just happens there is a rifle close to you that you could use to kill him. Unfortunately, it belongs to somebody who has publicly announced that he never wants anybody else to use his rifle. Using his rifle to kill the killer is a violation of his property rights. It is forbidden by the NAP. I won't poll people this time, but my guess is that most of you would be in favor of grabbing the rifle. Uh, there are two ways I've seen of trying to evade the conclusion that the NAP, although a very useful rule of thumb, is not the kind of absolute principle that libertarians routinely claim it is. One of them is to say that the real objective is not to never violate rights or to never initiate coercion, but to minimize the violation of rights. So you could then say that in the uh, case of the, of, 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 the, of the mass killer, when you seize a rifle, that's a much smaller violation of rights than what you're stopping, and therefore you're entitled to do it. Uh, the problem with that is that if that's your position, you no longer have an adequate argument for libertarian conclusions. Because now the people who disagree with you will say, well, yes, indeed, taxation is a violation of your property rights. But we need the money in order to pay police and soldiers to prevent people from being coerced by criminals in foreign countries. So you are then thrown back on an essentially consequentialist argument on trying to argue that you can successfully pr protect rights uh, without government taxation. Uh, you, the NAP no longer buys you anything once you turn it from a statement of what you, want to, what you may do to what you want to minimize. A different way in which I've seen people try to deal with this problem is to say that it's all right to violate rights as long as you compensate the victim. Now, to begin with, that means that you now approve of eminent domain as it is currently used by the government, because eminent domain consists of seizing property and then paying what is claimed to be a fair compensation for it. More generally, how do you decide what a fair compensation is? And I think the instinct of most libertarians would be what the owner of the property is willing to accept. Uh, but the owner of the property might not be willing to accept any payment that you can make. He might not be willing to accept any payment at all. So I think neither of those uh, solves uh, the fundamental problem, uh, which is that the NAP itself is a position that nobody really believes in. It, it's good for rhetoric. It lets you feel yummy. Uh, you can say, look at those evil people who want to initiate coercion. But in fact, you would yourself be in favor of initiating coercion under some imaginable circumstances. So your fundamental disagreement is that you don't think those circumstances exist, that you believe we are in a rule, world where we can prevent horrible things from happening without initiating coercion. That's a consequentialist argument, not a moral argument. The second problem with the non-aggression, with the NAP, is that it is a moral argument. And unfortunately, we have no way of deriving moral arguments. Ayn Rand thought she did. You can find a chapter in the third edition of my book, Machinery of Freedom, which is dedicated to taking apart her claimed argument, which I believe does not hold up. Uh, one of the striking things about Rand is that whenever there is a hole in her argument, she covers it up with beautiful rhetoric. Very good writer. Very brave woman, I should say, uh, and an original woman. She's just wrong about quite a lot of things. <laughs> Probably I'm wrong about quite a lot of things, too, but I don't know which ones. Uh, <laughs> the, so as far as I can tell, uh, David Hume was correct when he argued in the 18th century that there is no way of proving moral conclusions from the facts of reality, no way of getting from is to ought. And if there's no way of getting from is to ought, then even if you were happy, even if you believed in the NAP, you have no response to the person who says, why should I believe that? You have no way of showing him that the NAP is in fact a correct moral rule, which is what you need to do. So that's 
the basis of my claim that the NAP is not, in fact, a satisfactory basis for defending libertarianism, nor is it even a principle that people really believe in. So the next step, somebody who's thinking very quickly might say, but if you cannot derive any normative conclusions, if you have no way of showing what's morally right, how can you make any arguments at all for what should happen? Uh, and the answer to that is that I don't have to derive moral arguments. I don't have to derive values because all of the people I want to con convince already have moral beliefs. So I don't have to show what moral beliefs are true. I only have to show that in terms of their beliefs, not uh, the stated principles that they say, but what ends they want, uh, my system is better than the, than the alternatives. Uh, if you observe people, you find that, in fact, most people agree mostly on what outcomes are desirable. Their beliefs aren't identical. They give different weights to different things. But as far as I can tell, I've never yet heard anybody argue that the reason his economic system is better is that it produces more poverty <laughs> or more disease or more ignorance or worse novels. Uh, that as far as I can tell, pretty much everybody, if you look at the arguments they actually make, uh, believes in about the same set of values, not identical values. And the reason that they proclaim different principles is that they disagree about what principles lead to what values. Uh, I was struck quite a long time ago by the fact that if you look at the arguments that Marxists make, they seem to agree with our principles. Because in theory, Marxism says, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And it would follow from that that if workers are good at working, they should do the working. And if billionaires need Rolls Royces, they should get Rolls Royces. But in fact, the Marxist argument on exploitation is the claim that everything is produced by the workers, some of it is consumed by the capitalists, and that's wrong. Well, that's a libertarian argument. They've got the economics wrong. But the underlying principle is that you get ownership of something by producing it, which is our principle. Uh, the reason that this is enough, the reason that the imperfect agreement on ends is sufficient, is that a libertarian society is not just a little bit better than the alternatives. All right? If it were the case that we really faced the choice, do we have a welfare state uh, or a complete laissez-faire system. And if, it were the, if the answer were, with the welfare state, there will be fewer poor people, but the society as a whole will be a little bit poorer. The total income of everybody will be a little lower than somebody who puts a high weight on uh, helping the poor might say, I prefer the welfare state. But I don't think anybody in this room believes that, that if you actually look at the outcomes of various uh, things w ranging from welfare states uh, to fully socialist systems, they are not just a little bit worse, not even a little bit worse than the outcomes of relatively laissez-faire societies that have existed, let alone than at least we believe the outcome would be of a more fully uh, laissez-faire society. Uh, most of us believe, probably all of us believe, that a laissez-faire society would have less poverty. Interesting factoid, not a proof because correlation is not uh, causation. If you look at poverty rates in the U.S. over the period since World War II, you observe that they fell steeply. The percentage of the population that was poor by a fixed definition fell steeply until roughly the point at which the war on poverty got fully funded. It has been roughly constant since then that the actual, the, the intended effect of the world at war on poverty, uh, Charles Murray's book, first book, uh, discusses this, was to get people out of poverty, to make people self-supporting. The actual effect was to make poverty somewhat less, less unpleasant and leave people poor. Uh, I was struck uh, some years ago when I visited India by the fact that India observed by a foreigner, looked like the picture of a capitalist society held by a loyal communist who had never been outside of the Soviet Union. 
It was a mass of miserably poor people. But then there was the business school I spoke at, which was in a lovely campus, trees, grass, surrounded by a high wall with barbed wire on top of it. India, at that time, had had a socialist government since it was founded. Uh, when I read a novel set in the Soviet Union, what struck me was that the obvious difference in status and income between the physician and that woman who cleaned his house was enormously greater than the difference I observed between me and people I hired to, to clean my, my house, uh, one of whom is a UC Irvine student, or at least was a little while ago. Nice people. Uh, the, so that if you actually look at the results, if you say what we want is a society where you don't have massive inequality, in particular you don't have people who are very poor, uh, most of us believe and would argue that uh, libertarian society is more likely to give that result, not less. People who disagree about politics quite often put the arguments, or at least imagine them, as you are evil people. You don't care if the poor starve. Uh, or if we're doing it, you don't care if people's rights are violated. Uh, Putting your argument in terms of the NAP makes it easier for them to believe that. Because it sounds as though you're saying, well, I can't really show that you're wrong about the consequences of my policies. But I've got this principle which says that even if the poor starve, we still shouldn't violate property rights. Uh, rhetorically speaking, in terms of persuading people, that's a very stupid argument to make, <laughs> whether you believe in the NAP or not. Because in fact, we do have good arguments. We do have good reasons to believe that the system uh, <clears throat> that we support produces better outcomes than the systems that they support. Uh, I like to, in an odd way, this is a rerun of a debate that I had in 1982. That was with George Smith, unfortunately no longer alive, very bright and interesting guy. And the title of that one was Economics versus Philosophy which is the better foundation for libertarianism. And as I like to point out, philosophers still read Aristotle and economists don't. That is to say, there has actually been quite substantial progress in economics over the last few centuries. I'm not sure there's been regress in philosophy. Uh, I would have said that Rawls is probably a step down. Uh, but there has not been the kind of progress that lets you say we actually know stuff. Uh, so it makes much more sense to base our argument on economics uh, than our argument on philosophy. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the people who do it, you find that although not all economists are libertarian, and, and quite a lot of them are not anarchists, oddly enough, nonetheless, among academics, the economists are the ones who are most likely to be sympathetic to our views, and the philosophers, with the exception of, of, of Michael Humer, uh, those who are least likely to. Uh, so I think there is some evidence that economics is a better way of persuading people uh, than, than philosophy is. So to summarize my argument, it is that the NAP, as usually understood, has implications that nobody agrees with, it is that if you take a weaker form of the NAP, such as minimizing coercion or compensating people when you violate their rights, uh, it does not solve the problems and in particular no longer makes good arguments for libertarianism because you're now thrown back on consequentialist arguments about what policies will or will not violate more rights than others. Uh, and furthermore, that there is no way to derive the NAP uh, just as there is no way to derive anybody else's moral principles that I can see. Uh, that furthermore, we do not need the NAP because libertarianism is enough better than the alternatives so that it is better in terms of the values that most people already have. And that if you want to persuade people, showing them that a minimum wage will hurt poor people by pricing them out of the market 
with the result that, that many of them are unemployed and never take the first step up the ladder that leads to a better life is a whole lot better salute, better tactic than saying, well, you can't use the, uh, you, you can't impose the minimum wage law because imposing a minimum wage law uh, will violate the rights of the employee and the employer to make whatever contract they want. Uh, so that's my basic argument. Uh, and I will give my opponent the 55 seconds that are still left. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Now to establish the case for the negative of the resolution is Gene Epstein. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Everybody can hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, in a forthcoming biography of the brilliant economist Milton Friedman, we learn about the daily debates Milton conducted with his wife and kids. According to the book, Milton's son David recalls that he was, quote, a senior in high school before he realized that there were forms of conversation other than argument. Uh, while, while debates usually persisted across dinners, the book continues, the family relied on a numerical code to establish clear victories. A, declara a declaration of two stood for, you are right, I was wrong. Close quote. Needless to say, David will make my day if he flashes me a two once we conclude our debate. But I certainly don't expect such an outcome against an opponent with that kind of training. <laughs> uh, but I do wonder if the Friedman family ever debated today's topic. So if so, I'm going to guess that Milton took my position. Consider what Milton once said about the war on drugs. Quote, the major basis for my opposition to the war on drugs has not been that it's produced a lot more harm than good. It's been primarily a moral view. I do not believe the state has any more right to tell me what can come out of my, what I can, what to put in my mouth than it has to tell me what can come out of my mouth. Th these two are essentially the same thing, and they are both essential elements of freedom." Close quote. So in making his case against the government's war on drugs, Milton was forthrightly stating his belief in the centrality of the non-aggression principle, or what I prefer to call the zero aggression principle, or ZAP, after libertarian philosopher Gerard Casey. As Casey puts it, no one, whether individually or as a member of a group, may initiate or threaten to initiate the use of physical violence or aggression against the person or property of another." Close quote. The war on drugs is the state threatening aggression against us if we dare to exercise our right to put certain chemicals in our bodies. By viewing the freedom argument as central, Milton wasn't ignoring the arguments that the war on drugs also does far more harm than good. Rather, he was placing the burden of proof where it belongs, on those who would defend the idea of putting people in a cage for doing something that could harm nobody but themselves. Now take the consequentialist case that David would make. Defenders of the government's war on drugs have a much easier time responding to it. They can logically object that a world in which all drugs are completely legal is a world that does not as yet exist. And since it doesn't exist, we libertarians can't rule out the danger that drug addiction will become so common it will tear at the fabric of society. The only effective way to respond to that point is to invoke 
Milton's moral argument. The burden of proof is not on us libertarians to argue that our society could survive full legalization of drugs. The burden is on them to prove that it will lead to horrific outcomes. And since they're ta talking about a world that does not as yet exist, it's a burden they can't sustain. In this case, then, David would have us believe that the right way to persuade people of the libertarian solution to the government's war on drugs is by showing them that the outcomes of full legalization are superior without any resort to the flawed non-aggression principle. My point, by contrast, is that not only does it greatly help to cite the zero-aggression principle when making this argument, it's often essential. Another example, the libertarian case for free trade. No one has done a better job than David in explaining the economic gains from trade. He asks us to consider two ways to make cars build them in a domestic factory, or grow them in the form of wheat. Do it the second way, ship the wheat to Japan, and a few months later, ships appear loaded with Toyotas. That's a way of convincing people about the benefits of trade by pointing to a positive outcome. But it doesn't address a key objection raised by economist Russ Roberts. You start to make the case for free trade, Russ Roberts observed in a recent interview, and people are saying, right, but the folks who are left behind, their lives aren't meaningful anymore. And you respond, oh, but look at the gains from trade. That's the way the economist deals with the fact that sometimes imports are hard for people. I think the economist view is really bad, close quote. The problem then, is that David's argument doesn't directly address Russ Roberts' objection. When you allow imports of Toyotas to destroy jobs along with the communities in which those job holders live, the lives of those affected aren't meaningful anymore. The only way to respond is by asking what right does the government have to penalize me for using my money to buy imported goods or services that I freely choose to buy? If domestic workers want to, keep, want to keep my business, they are perfectly free to lower their prices, uh, to, to lower their wages, while getting their firms to lower their prices. And domestic workers and their supporters are quite free to create a Buy American Shopping website that patronizes only domestic firms on the grounds that many Americans' lives will otherwise lose their meaning. That domestic shopping website might attract a lot of followers. For many years after World War II, Jews boycotted German cars even though the cars offered great value. My own father participated in that silent boycott, and then later he would buy only US-made cars for patriotic reasons. My father did all this voluntarily. The government had no right to coerce him into buying American-made cars if he preferred to buy cars from abroad. So in making the case for free trade, not only does it greatly help to cite the zero aggression principle, it's often essential. That's because no consequentialist case for radical reform made by a libertarian can ever be completely sufficient. The consequentialist case is usually important, but we also need to invoke the zero aggression principle to establish the point that our default position is always in favor of freedom and free choice, and the burden of proof is always on those who would restrict our freedom and free choice. I could apply this same argument to many other aspects of the libertarian case, from gun rights to legalizing sex work to preventing the waging of war. But in the time remaining, I want to focus on the other key point in David's argument, that the zero aggression principle, or ZAP, is in some crucial way a flawed principle. David makes several key points against the ZAP in his book, The Machinery of Freedom. 
One is that, quote, libertarians have not yet produced any proof that our moral position is correct, since, quote, lots of people are in favor of initiating coercion. One possible response to such people, as proposed by philosopher Gerard Casey, is that if they reject the zero aggression principle, they logically open themselves up to the risk that, that someone else will initiate aggression against them. And then they'll have no principled grounds on which to reject such aggression. And while many authoritarians won't be impressed by this argument, I don't see why we should be the least bit impressed in return. Some might reject the idea that murder is a crime, but that doesn't mean we have to agree with them. Here's another of David's arguments. When it comes to aggression against someone's property, it's impossible to draw the line at what does and does not constitute such aggression. Quote, if I fire a thousand megawatt laser beam at your front door, I am surely violating your property, David writes. But what if I reduce the intensity of the brightness of a to a flashlight or to, a, or, to, or to turn on my light in a house or strike a match? David then comments, the obvious response is that only significant violations of my property rights count. But then he clinches the argument with the challenge, but who decides what is significant? But doesn't David's challenge of where to draw the line apply to a whole range of cases most of us subscribe to, including David himself? Take the law against assault and battery. If someone extends his hand to you for a handshake and then breaks the bones of your hand, that painful injury would surely justify an actionable claim. But what if someone merely gives you a firm handshake? Uh, if people with merely firm handshakes were getting indicted for assault and battery, would David argue that we have to, uh, we have to regard the assault and battery as potentially discardable and flawed and full of holes? Uh, those, those, there are those who claim to feel battered if someone makes an innocuous remark that they decide to take personally. And there have been co-op buildings in Manhattan where smoking tobacco in your apartment was forbidden even with your doors and windows closed on the bizarre grounds that you might seriously infect your neighbors in, order, in, in other apartments with secondhand smoke. So maybe we'll soon have neighbors charging you with aggression if you turn on the lights in your house. The very danger David warns against. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we can only hope to live in a sane society where reasonable people adjudicate such matters reasonably and sanely. It doesn't mean we discard the zero aggression principle. David's other objection involves cases in which someone commits aggression in extenuating circumstances. One of David's favorite cases involves your neighbor falling from his balcony and grabbing a flagpole on your balcony in order to break his fall. That person has clearly trespassed on your property. If my balcony had been invaded in this way, I would only be happy that my neighbor wasn't injured while marveling, marveling at his physical dexterity. But, but if others did bring charges of trespass, the intruder would have to plead guilty because the zero aggression principle is an absolute principle that is always actionable always actionable, always absolute. But then there's the question of punishment. The intruder would be well advised to plead for mercy on the ground that he meant no harm and was only trying to save his own life. Or suppose, quote, suppose you happen to know that everyone in the world is going to die tomorrow by some natural catastrophe, writes David. Further suppose that the only way to prevent it involves stealing a piece of equipment worth $100 from someone who rightfully owns it, close quote. Do you steal the equipment and save the world? I certainly would. After my crime was committed, I would, exp I would explain to the owner of the equipment the reason for my theft. If he still brought charges against me, I would be forced to admit my guilt. So there is never any question that in all of these cases, aggression against property 
has occurred and is therefore an actionable offense. It is an absolute principle, always applied absolutely. The separate question is the penalty imposed. At my trial, I would ask that in imposing punishment, those who judge me take into account that I was saving everyone in the world from extinction. <laughs> Another example from David, so, quote, Suppose we are threatened with military conquest by a particularly vicious totalitarian government. If the conquest is successful, we will lose most of our freedom and many of us will lose our lives, close quote. Under these circumstances, says David, wouldn't we favor forced conscription to raise an army, even though conscription is slavery and therefore never justified? As David writes, isn't temporary slavery better than the permanent slavery of totalitarian rule? I would still be against conscription. First, of course, conscription would only be necessary if we couldn't get enough volunteers to resist the invader and enough folks voluntarily offering the money to back these volunteers. But who was to say before the fact that an army of possibly reluctant conscripts would be victorious against the invader? We'd then be choosing temporary slavery without necessarily avoiding the permanent slavery that David warns against. But then who's to say that the slavery would be permanent? As Murray Rothbard has pointed out, the main reason a conquering country can rule a defeated country is that the latter has an existing state apparatus uh, to transmit and enforce the victor's orders onto a subject population, close quote. No such apparatus would exist in a libertarian society. Instead, as Rothbard also points out, the occupiers would likely be confronted by resistance fighters whose persistence could eventually drive the victors out. Such things have happened in the past. In his 1973 book, The Machinery of Freedom, David wrote, I believe that everyone has a right to run his own life, to go to hell in his own fashion, close quote. The right to go to hell in one's own fashion without interference from the state or from others is in fact the essence of the zero aggression principle stated in audacious terms. Getting back to those legendary debates at Friedman family dinners, did David think up that great line in the heat of debate and save it for the book he would eventually write? I like to imagine he did. Thanks. <laughs> Seven and a half minutes. No. Okay, seven, he's gonna, yep. seven and a half. So David now has seven and a half minutes to rebut. I was hoping that when Gene started out by telling you about our family code number two, that the next thing he was going to say was number two, and that would then end the, the debate, but apparently not. He's, he's mistaken about our debates in a number of ways. To begin with, uh, while my father certainly made moral arguments, as I did and do, he did not put them in terms of the absolute NAP for presumably the sort of reasons that I've discussed. He, in fact, was in favor of taxation. Uh, he was, one of the things we ended up disagreeing about was whether or not you should have an anarchist society. And his position was that the system I described might work, but probably wouldn't. My position was that it might not work, but probably would. Uh, I devote a chapter of the third edition of Machinery to discussing ways in which it might break down. That was a consequentialist disagreement. Uh, he did not at any point say, but in order to have my limited, or did I say, in order to have this uh, limited state, you've got to have taxation, and taxation uh, is, is immoral. Uh, so in fact, my father was not an anarchist, and I was. Uh, and in fact, uh, as Gene might have deduced from looking at the first edition of the Machinery of Freedom, which was written in about 1970, I think it was published in 72 as I remember, I was indeed more fond of moral arguments then than now. Uh, so that my guess is that in our arguments I probably often used moral arguments, though not put as explicitly as the NAP back then. I should say, lest you overestimate just how retarded I was in understanding a conversation, I did enter my senior year in high school when I was 15. Uh, <laughs> But 
In, with regard to Jean's response uh, with regard to the war on drugs, it is certainly true that we cannot prove that abolishing the war on drugs would have good effects. You cannot prove that continuing the war on drugs has good effects. You can't even say it has observable effects now, but next year is going to be different. Every year is different. Unfortunately, there are very few things one can prove in this world. One has to be satisfied with the best arguments one can offer, uh, reasons to believe something is true, not proofs that something, that something is true. Uh, with regard to Russ Roberts' argument, which I haven't read, but I've just gotten from Gene, I do not claim that my story about growing Hondas proves that tariffs are bad. What it does is to prove that some arguments for tariffs are bad. It shows that the trade-off is not between the welfare of American auto workers and Japanese auto workers, which is the way most people who support tariffs imagine it, but rather between the welfare of American auto workers and American farmers. Well, American farmers can also have their way of life destroyed by an insufficient demand for what they are doing. Uh, but in general, I don't think one can prove in a sense of establishing 100% probability that uh, libertarian society is better. Uh, all one can do is to show good reasons to believe it is better, and that's the best that one, that one can ever do. Uh, I was sort of puzzled by Gene's argument that you, shouldn't accept, that you should accept the NAP because if you don't accept the NAP, uh, then uh, you might be at, at risk of having people coerce you. I presume that lots of you do accept the NAP and nonetheless you get coerced. <laughs> that there seems to be a bizarre logic in which you suppose if I believe something, that forces everybody who interacts with me to believe, to believe it. It isn't true. So that's not, in fact, an argument for believing uh, in, in the NAP. I notice that Gene, on his expressed principles, has to approve of eminent domain because he has told us that it is all right to violate people's property rights, provided you're willing to bear the, the, the cost that results. And in eminent domain, we have a legal process. It's not a jury trial as it happens, but a legal process for determining how much the government owes you for the property that it seized. Uh, and that seems to be his view of how you, how you settle uh, such, uh, su such questions. Uh, The, yeah, I want to go back to the fact that, as I think I made clear yesterday, my arguments for anarchy are not claimed proofs. My favorite online writer, Scott Alexander, ended his review of Machinery of Freedom with the comment that he hoped my system would be tried somewhere far from him. <laughs> he was right. I think it's better. But obviously, you better if somebody else tries it. And if it doesn't work, that, that doesn't affect me. And if it does work, then I can imitate it then. Uh, we live in a world of uncertainty, even if we like to pretend we don't. That one of the things that I find irritating here is the number of people who are absolutely 100% certain who are the bad guys, who are the good guys, what's right, what's wrong. We don't live in that world. We live in a world where the best you can do is to look at the arguments, look at the evidence, and reach conclusions. Uh, now, I should say, I am not arguing that you should never make moral arguments. Clearly, rhetorically, moral arguments sometimes persuade people because sometimes people share some of your moral beliefs uh, as well as some of your consequential beliefs. But what I don't think people share if they think about it is the strong form of the libertarian preferred moral belief, which is the NAP, because as I've pointed out, it leads to conclusions that none of us really believe in and you don't solve the problem by saying, well, it's actually all right to initiate coercion. You just have to pay for it, uh, which as far as I can tell is, is, is Gene's, Gene's solution to it. Uh, I think that's most of what I wanted to say. Uh, let, me, let me point out some evidence that I've observed about people disagreeing less in even their moral beliefs than they think they do that if you argue with a socialist uh, about uh, whether or not uh, property owners are allowed to own property, it rapidly turns out that your imaginary story for the poor guy and the rich guy is very different from his. That in his 
In your imaginary story, the rich guy spent his resources hacking down the jungle to plant a field while the poor guy sat there watching. In the socialist view, the poor guy hacked out the field and then the rich guy stole it from him. And I think that suggests that there is more common, even in the underlying moral intuitions, uh, let alone the underlying beliefs of what people want. So I think I've made, made my argument. We're going to have some time for you people to ask questions, uh, and uh, we will see what Eugene, what Gene's uh, rebuttal is. We will very... We will very soon be going to uh, question and answer, so I'd like you guys to be thinking of questions for both the affirmative and the negative, and I'll be taking those in succession. But to rebut for the negative is Gene. Well, I, I was looking forward to getting a fuller story and getting corrected by David about my little mention about Milton Friedman. I love that passage in the book that has actually not yet been released, but uh, my son read it in pre-release and showed me that passage, which I really loved. And in fact, uh, as a columnist at Barron's, I interviewed Milton Friedman, and two or three times a year, I would call him up just for a chat. In fact, I spoke with him about a month before he died. And uh, uh, that was one of the great pleasures of my life. And uh, so I wanted to provoke some reminiscence about Milton. Everything Milton, uh, David said about Milton is true. I concede that completely. He know, knew him better than I, even though I had the pleasure of getting to know him as a columnist at Barron's. Uh, but uh, let me just uh, read to you what David just said, which is essentially what I'm trying to say. There are very few things one can prove in this world, indeed. Uh, obviously, the fact that you and we can prove a few things, you guys are sitting here, very few things one can prove in this world. And that's the reason why David's powerful consequentialist arguments, part of which I enlisted, need the grounding of what I again prefer to call the zero aggression principle, precisely because there are very few things we can prove in this world. We need to tell people I have met who fantasize that 90% of the country is going to get drunk on drugs and the other 10% is going to starve. Again, David mentioned Russ Roberts but didn't speak to his concern. Russ is now an economist. He's pref he prefers to talk about human feeling. We, talk, we, we do look at communities that got broken up by free trade and all the rest of it. And Russ says, oh, the gains from trade. It's pathetic. We can't talk about that. Look at those people who suffered. So my point is to ground it in the zero aggression principle, but then also recognize that, that people, in terms of their purchases, always often feel uh, compassion for others, the, the, the idea that people would buy American and for patriotic reasons, my own father did it. The point is that, that once we ground it in the zero aggression principle, then we can understand these things. Uh, he, David mentioned uh, eminent domain, and, but of course I'm not for it. The burden of proof is someone on, who take your property. By the way, I don't know if David's in love with the Chicago thesis. The Chicago guys have it wrong. The, if, if, if your property, the, the Austrians teach us, that this, that all value is subjective. That for the government to give you the market price for your property, well, well, what if your, what if your ancestors are buried on that property? No, I wouldn't accept ten million dollars for property that you think is worth a hundred thousand dollars. Of course, you don't abrogate property rights. The, so the burden of proof is on someone who can prove to us the unprovable that in some, in this world where eminent domain is permitted, that you can somehow bring about such overwhelming, you can somehow avoid human catastrophe, and it's all ridiculous. Of course, I'm against eminent domain for precisely the same reason. Grounded in what David feels we can conveniently ignore, the zero aggression principle. You don't take people's property. And, and the idea that you can give it to them with, with just come, that's crazy. There is no such thing. They don't want to sell you that property, period, full stop. Do something else with your life rather than take my property Forcibly. Uh, let me introduce another example since, well, what, what else did David mention? The moral argument? Well, no, indeed, I agreed. 
that ultimately I could say to somebody who, who doesn't care about aggression to say, well, you know, you won't have a logical defense if somebody aggresses against you. But of course, as I conceded, and as David pointed out, they can reject my idea. Well, might makes right. I don't give it. I'll just beat up anybody who tries to aggress. Of course, there are people in this world who simply will not be convinced about our belief in the zero aggression principle. And I'm certainly not enough of a philosopher to invoke all the fundamental reasons why I believe in it. I just think it's as natural as breathing as some of the rest of you probably think. So indeed, if David wants to say, well, it's only as natural as breathing, you're just a shallow philosopher, David will be absolutely right. But, but, but the next part, war is an important issue because, by the way, what, what do I hear all the time? Well, well, if we'd only stayed there for another two or three years, we finally would have won. We got out of Afghanistan after 20 years. Another five years, if we hadn't been so craven, we finally would have won. There's never enough war and killing for these people who have this religious faith. I don't know if I can convince them, but I can only tell them, and David apparently can't, that you're going to kill more people. Uh, and don't you think the burden of proof is on you and, and that it's a burden you cannot sustain because we've had 20 years of killing or 10 years of killing and we haven't gotten anywhere? So again, you, we can't leave home without it precisely because of David's point. We can only marshal our data, all of it necessary, all of it important. I'm not a philosopher. I was economics columnist at Barron's for, for, for 26 years. I was trained in economics and in the Austrian school, which I think is more worthwhile because, again, it, it you know, I, uh, my, uh, my namesake, Richard Epstein, will talk about, well, the government can always give somebody with eminent domain the, the right amount of money. I, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if Milton felt that way. I never asked him about eminent domain, but, uh, but certainly, uh, uh, maybe he would have said that, but that's ridiculous from an Austrian standpoint. All value is subjective. Doesn't want to sell, he doesn't want to sell. No price is good enough. Uh, I guess I want to end on my best moment with Milton. Milton was inveighing against the war on drugs, and indeed, he was talking consequentially. He mentioned a point about crime in the, in the, in the poor quarters of the country because of the war on drugs, and I said, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I said to him, and Milton said to me, if you don't know that, you really are very ignorant. And, and that, that, that was my favorite moment with Milton. We all are very ignorant of the world. We all have to cope with the facts of the world in an ignorant way, just like David has to. We can only marshal our arguments. We can never prove things in this world. We need the zero aggression principle to, to recognize where the burden of proof lies, and is in all of these cases, the other side cannot bear that burden. Thanks. We will now be going over to the question and answer. I'd like uh, people to be having questions for both the affirmative and the negative, one at a time, and I'll be transferring, but I will take the moderator's prerogative. And I will ask the first questions. Uh, the uh, question I have for the affirmative. Uh, there is, David, the uh, socialist uh, calculation problem. There's also the consequentialist uh, calculation problem, that the number of outcomes of any particular action are actually infinite. Uh, they are primary and secondary and tertiary and out, ad, ad, ad infinitum. And that for each, each possible action, there would be values that would be placed by each and every individual, each person living and pe people living in the future that we would have to calculate. And then eventually, once we get infinity by infinity, we would then have to combine these all into a single consequence and say, therefore, we go and, and don't, go, don't go. Don't we need some sort of bedrock if our goal isn't just to uh, employ economics professors? If your argument is that the consequences, sorry, is this, this on? Is on? If your argument is that the consequences of acts are not knowable for certain, that's true. But if you really believe that that prevents reaching conclusions, I don't know how, how you take any actions at all. 
You don't even know whether feeding Ron Paw, who I was hoping was actually going to be moderating because he's much handsomer than Dennis. <laughs> For all you know, the result of feeding Ron Paw is that he will get sufficient energy to bite somebody and kill them. You can't be sure it isn't true. But in the real world, the way we deal with individual choices and choices among societies we want is by doing our best to figure out what will happen, knowing that we might be wrong. That's, that's the world we live in. I, 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 you, you know, I want to comment on David's answer. I should have told you in advance. If somebody gives a, uh, answers a so question. Speak into the microphone, please. Sorry, yeah. I, okay, I, I just want to remind you as a moderator, as when I moderate, a question is asked of one person, the other person gets to comment. Uh, now, of, co of, course, of course, David is right that clearly, as we libertarians like to emphasize, most of life is not a libertarian problem. In most cases, uh, we entrepreneurs act on hunches. Uh, uh, entrepreneurs take risks. They, they have to deal with the facts as they know, as well as their creative notion about where the future lies. I'm restricting myself to the libertarian arguments, which are narrowly focused on the predations of government or the predations of others. It's a narrow field. That's where the zero aggression principle becomes crucial and important. That's where it applies, but not to most of life, as I imagine most of you already know. Yeah. So let me ask uh, of the negative. Most people upon hearing the non-aggression principle would say, yes, that's very, uh, very true. I, I kind of feel that. But there's really not really aggression. There's really not force. Most people will comply. And I am so concerned about this particular outcome for this particular segment that I'm willing to go ahead and ignore uh, the, uh, the possible theoretical uh, initiation of violence with, uh, uh, in order to help this particular segment. Well, absolutely. It is possible that uh, even if I tell people who are quite prepared to put you and me in a cage for, you, for, for using certain substances, even if I tell them that you bear a very heavy burden of proof to show that it would be disastrous uh, in this unknown world for, for there to be 90, uh, for, for, for there uh, to be legal, full legalization of drugs, even if I tell them that and I can't convince them, then I guess I have to give up. I'm only talking about at least doing my best to offer them the right argument. I, if I want to tell Russ Roberts that as much as you weep for the people whose lives are meaningless, are you really going to impose government's solution to impose penalties on the rest of us, including poor people who want to buy what they want to buy from abroad? Uh, are you really still willing to do that? Yes, I am. Well, I can't convince him ultimately, but at least I've given him the best argument possible. Milton, uh, uh, David, if you could. Uh, do you want to comment on that? or No, I'm, uh, I, okay. I want to take okay. questions from the audience. So uh, the first question for the affirmative. This is for both. Okay. He can ask any question he wants from anybody. Uh, <clears throat> question is for both. Using the uh, guy falling out of the building, grabbing onto the uh, flagpole. Um, let's say somehow that flag it causes serious property damage, let's say $10,000. Would you say that the person who fell then is liable for the, for the repairs? Sure. Yes. Well, if you certainly, if you, uh, uh, again, uh, my, my point I want to stress is that all of these violations of the zero aggression principle, again, as I prefer to call it, uh, it zero is better than and none, uh, that is that uh, they are always and absolutely actionable. Uh, and uh, if, if, I, if I own the balcony and uh, this incredible daredevil managed to save his life by grabbing the flagpole, I might, I might just settle at 5,000 and absorb the rest because I'd just be astonished by the story of what he did. But, so therefore, the, the penalty and what actually happens in real life is a completely separate question. The violation is there. But indeed, certainly, uh, if I were a different kind of person, I might say, well, you know, $10,000 well, worth plus a fine. You owe me 11,000, you owe me 12,000. Very possibly, sure, uh, that could be imposed. Yeah. 
Gene, could you push that mic up so it's, yeah, there, that's good. Uh, next question. Uh, this question is for the negative and it might touch on what you were just saying yeah. uh, a little bit. Yeah. And please do uh, either of you uh, correct me if any of my characterizations here are incorrect. Sure. Um, in response to David's point related to the continuum problem of casting photons at someone without permission, oh, yeah. you know, whether the megawatt laser or the yeah. match, yeah. 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 Um, you raised the existence of similar continuum problems such as handshake grip and essentially said that we don't really have a problem resolving that. So this sort of problem is not insurmountable. But isn't the question not whether or not they are insurmountable, but insurmountable using the zero aggression principle as a basis? That is, how does the non-aggression principle or zero aggression principle actually tell us what the proper grip is or verify that such a grip was used or communicate that information beforehand to either party? Don't our methods of resolving those questions necessarily reduce to constructing answers on grounds that are at least partially consequentialist or reliant on external principles? Um, well, I, I, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, the, the, there's no question that, in the examples I cited, that we face that problem right now in this society. Uh, right now, again, a co-op will say, windows closed, doors closed, but there's secondhand smoke. So to some of my imagination, I say something to you that that says that you know, you know, whatever I might say that's uh, glancing or whatever it might be, it's actionable. So therefore, there's no question that or, or take take the issue of murder. If you were involved in some causal way with the death of another person, uh, there's always it's always actionable. But society faces judgment calls in difficult cases having to do with were you negligent in driving the truck that hit that person? If, you, if your tire b b went out and that person was accidentally hit, to what extent are you responsible? Well, the, the jury would have to look at uh, to what extent w w did you have new tires? Uh, Society is constantly faced at the margin with difficult cases in establishing, in applying every principle, including, in my example, the example of murder. So therefore, I would say that, and again, in applying the zero aggression principle, just as in the case of murder or assault or any of those other cases, the light or the rest of it, that we face these problems all the time, but, but we, don't, we don't say, well, the absolute rule against murder is absolute. However, we, we do have to recognize the problems in applying it in, in, in difficult cases. Intent, first degree murder, all of those problems come up all the time, but we don't repudiate the absolute rule against so many of these cases, as in the case of assault, murder, or in the case of, uh, of the light or the beam. You have to apply your re reasonable standards of society to these principles. So if your point is, is it, does the zero aggression principle inform your judgment? Well, it does inform your judgment in that clearly you recognize that there's a potential for, for aggression here. But in, admittedly, as in the case of murder or all the rest of it, your judgment has to be informed by the norms of society and by what people regard as sane and sensible. That's the best answer I can get. I don't see that we repudiate the zero principle principle because of these difficult cases any more than we repudiate all the other cases that arrive in society that arise in society today. Let me comment on that because in fact in Machinery of Freedom I follow that point with a chapter on economic analysis of law. And the economic analysis of law which is the central part of economics that I've been doing in recent decades is an attempt to figure out what the rules ought to be if what you want to do is to maximize economic efficiency. Uh, I don't think we have a good way of knowing how to maximize individual liberty. That would be a good thing if you could. But economic efficiency, which is some sort of a, a way, an imperfect way of adding up how well everybody else is, everybody is, uh, is the best we've got at this point. And one can, in fact, use economics to analyze questions such as what should the penalty for a crime be, what counts as a crime, and so forth. You can't do anything like a perfect job of it because we don't have enough information. But if people are actually curious about how you would approach that problem, one of my other books is called Law's Order, 
Uh, you can read that on my web page, like most of my things you can read on my web page. And that sketches out how you would approach questions such as light bulb versus uh, laser beam from the standpoint of economics. Hello. The examples so far have focused on the consequence for the violation of the aggression principle, and I, I don't think we're looking for an abdication of responsibility. But I wondered about an example that looked more at the efficacy of the non-aggression principle in the argument. For example, um, I teach school, and there has certainly been a lot of coercion to get a vaccine lately, for which I will not comply, nor has my administration made me feel like I needed to, thankfully, though I was never in a position where I would have. But for many people, I've said to them, what are you willing to do to vaccinate me? Because you would have to pin me down and give it to me forcibly with me fighting the entire time. So what are you willing to do to force my compliance? And I wondered what would be your argument absent the non-aggression principle that would be as effective in that realm? Thank you. I guess my basic argument would be that having institutions that let people coerce other people is much more likely to result in coercing them in ways that make the world worse than in ways that make the world better. That if we could have a government that is a dictatorship by a perfectly wise, benevolent despot, what I like to refer to as a bureaucrat god, uh, who knew now everything. We live in your utopia, that, but we get, that how in, do we convince in, them? That in that world, indeed, you could improve on the outcomes of freedom, that in that world the perfectly wise benevolent despot could realize that you would be better off uh, with uh, getting vaccinated and would, you know, take some convenient occasion to put you unconscious and vaccinate you and maybe not even tell you because why upset you about it. But we don't live in that world. We live in a world where all of the decisions are being made by human beings. The human beings are making them not only with imperfect information, but with the wrong incentives, that each, each human being has an incentive to serve his own interests and those of people he cares about. The nice thing about the market is that it's a way of getting socially desirable outcomes out of individual selfishness. The political market doesn't do that. If you work out the, what public choice theory is the branch of economics that deals with it, if you work out what the implications of public choice theory are, you end up with a whole bunch of cases where people are forced to do things that make the world worse. That the U.S. is currently turning into alcohol 10% of the world's supply of the largest source of food in the world, namely maize. We are doing it on the claim that that will reduce CO2 output, despite the fact that everybody involved, including Al Gore, conceded years ago that it doesn't reduce uh, CO2 output. It does, however, raise the income of farmers and farmers vote. So the basic argument that I would make is not that there is nothing one can imagine a government doing or an individual doing that violates rights that would be a good thing, but only that institutions that allow you to violate rights will usually have bad consequences. I was hoping that that was, was the moderator I was expecting to have, but unfortunately, Ron Paul doesn't seem to be uh, doing it here. My, my only comment is that every once in a while, it, when I talk to people about the idea of vaccines, I just begin by pointing out to them, and every once in a while, they find it somewhat compelling to contemplate to contemplate the point that if, if the government is forcing you to put a chemical in your body that you don't want to put in your body, that's a defense of the zero aggression principle. That's an act of very, very serious aggression. And the default position is no such thing should happen. And uh, if you want to voluntarily use the vaccine, fine. And, and usually, amazingly, some people are convinced by that argument. You want to voluntarily use the vaccine, fine. Nobody has a right to force you into doing it. And that's, once again, the zero aggression principle, hopefully simplifying the issue. Unfortunately, that argument doesn't really work. 
because the people on the other side will tell you that by getting the disease, you are going to be aggressing against the people who catch it from you. I know, I and know. And therefore, they are entitled to force you to do what will keep you okay. from getting the disease. Since David responded to my response, let me respond to his response. Of, of, of course, of course, that's going to be the argument. Uh, and of course, that argument is also ridiculous, as David probably knows himself. The only point is to say that, again that, indeed, if, 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 uh, if you're going to kill uh, 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 you know, 50 people by not taking the, the vaccine, maybe there's some kind of argument for that, because the, the aggression is going to be far greater. The burden of proof is on you. Give us the evidence for that ridiculous claim. And we know, of course, that it was ridiculous in the case of this vaccine. That's and, the and whole people point. People did make that, well, I'm sorry? that argument. What? Just to be, people did make. Of course that they argument. did. Of course they. Of course. Of course. Of course they did. But give us. And but, that but, is. But, and that is a consequentialist question, not a moral question. Of course. But the burden morally is on you to make your argument. The default position is leave me alone. That's the whole point. Yeah. 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 Next. Yeah. This question is for the this this question is for the affirmative, and it uh, builds off the previous question. Uh, suppose that there was some hypothetical virus where the evidence was bearing out that uh, if you lock down the population, fewer people would die from it. Obviously, not COVID, as we all know, but for the sake of the question, suppose it's hypothetical. And suppose you were discussing a lockdown policy with somebody whose stated objective uh, was to minimize deaths from the virus, which a lot of people who were advocating for lockdowns during COVID, that's what they were saying that they wanted. How would you go about demonstrating that they should not want lockdowns by their own standards? I would point out to them that life is that, that, that minimizing deaths is not, in fact, the only thing they care about. That it would be pretty easy to point out to somebody that if you could reduce deaths by one by uh, putting everybody in prison for 50 years, it would not be desirable to do that. And they will then uh, presumably realize that there are a whole lot of costs and benefits to trade off and not just one. Uh, a going back a step, you would want. If you are making the argument today, you would want to say, look, in giving the government the power to do lockdowns, you are taking it for granted the government will only do it when it's a good idea. But we happen to have some evidence on this subject. Sweden did no lockdowns at all, uh, ended up doing probably a little bit better on excess mortality than most of the other countries, though not all of the countries. There is very little evidence that the lockdowns did any good, and that ought to make you conclude too late to change that one. But you ought to make you very suspicious of the government having the power to do something because you can observe that the government will not, in fact, restrict itself to doing that something only when it's a good idea. Well, uh, let me comment also in this way, which partly responds to what David said earlier. The, the, you might say that there's this kind of unfortunate like blend between my view and David's. I think David's consequentialist arguments are basically very sound, and I, I look to him to help us out with the consequentialist issues, and that's been my focus as an economist. Uh, so indeed, I, I grant in principle that if there's just some overwhelming disaster, which is which would be aggression against others, there, there, there's going to be massive deaths. There could conceivably be some kind of argument for lockdowns. But of course, as, as David pointed out, and as I would say, take the states and nations that had strict lockdowns, those that had very relatively loose, uh, the outcomes are virtually indistinguishable. The lockdowns achieved nothing. The lockdowns, however, did a lot of harm. But my only point then is that if David wants to point out to me, but, but you start talking consequentially yourself, I'm, an, I'm going to agree with that. I'm going to agree that there's some argument in principle between heaven and earth that you could make, that if 90% that if of the population is going to die and the rest of us are probably going to die for starvation, if we don't do something or other, then that's, that's immense aggression against others that we might need to avoid. To choose the other favorite example, in keeping with what David was saying, we, 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 we should impose a five mile an hour speed limit on drivers. Now, that would probably cause a lot of deaths anyway, but uh, 
but but obviously that would mean, that would reduce deaths on the highway. So indeed, we have the bias in, in favor of freedom, and that's my only point. That consequentialism matters, but but the zero aggression principle is a central, indispensable part of it. I have a question for Gene. Yeah. Okay. And that is, you said that if if a violate apparent violation of rights prevented massive violation of rights, then it's all right. What if it prevents massive costs that are not violations of rights? The point of my asteroid example originally is that an asteroid hitting Earth and killing everybody is not a rights violation. It's a catastrophe, but a non-rights non violation catastrophe. My own view, in terms of my moral position, is that violating rights is a bad thing, but not the only bad thing. And that therefore, it is legitimate to violate rights if you get very large benefits in terms of other values. And so the question is, if if the only way of preventing a catastrophe, which is not a rights violation, merely kills millions of people, is to violate somebody's rights, are you in favor of doing it? Yeah. Well, I, I thought I addressed that in, in the, your example about the totalitarian governments attacking. I, I simply cannot believe that in a libertarian society uh, that that, we're, that people would be so stupid as not to organize in a, some Hayekian way to quell the asteroid. I, I would not be bothered about about the lack of authority. But that's a consequentialist claim. If you're well, making well, yeah, an yeah, argument yeah, sure, of principle, yeah, yeah, yeah. you ought to be able to apply well, the argument under any circumstances, not just under well, the circumstances you've chosen. Well, okay, I, I, I guess I, I know. I, I, I guess I guess I think I think you 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 certainly make the point in in the extreme that it's that. It's conceivable, but I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think in this world it could ever happen. I guess, I guess that's my, when you talked about the totalitarian government attacking the asteroid, you mean people are so damn stupid that they don't know the asteroids come and won't do anything? We, we need the wise government to impose some kind of standard, but in your anarchist society, there won't be such a government, right? So why, what, what, how that, would That wasn't a government, an argument for a wise government. That was an argument for an individual stealing something in order to stop the asteroid. Oh, okay. Oh, the stealing something. Oh yeah, no, no, that's a crime. Oh no, no, that's actionable. No, no, no. In that particular case, that particular, case, I steal something to avoid the asteroid. Indeed, I should be indicted. Absolutely. But you should do it. Uh, yes. Therefore, I, you I, should I, violate co violate somebody's rights. You should initiate coercion, which violates the NAP. That's the point I've been making. No, well, super, super, I'm sorry. I would be guilty of the crime. Yeah, I, sure. I, and I should. It, excuse me. I, I, if, I guess we're, now we get into a, a brilliant. Moment of, of, of so fill up. I, I committed a crime, and I'm a criminal, and I'm absolutely liable for the crime. It all it, it absolutely applies to me. I'm a criminal, and I should stand trial for, for that criminal crime. So it's always an absolutely a crime. That's all. And that, but, now, but sometimes you should commit crimes. So sometimes you should violate I, rights. I, I, sometimes I will commit crimes. That's all, because I because I'm an immoral person, I guess. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to actually exercise a little bit of moderation. Yes, okay, enough, sure. enough. Uh, Take another question from the audience. Uh, hold on. Uh, 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 you asked the question of Gene. Gene, do you have a question of Milton? Of Dick? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right, all right. <laughs> Mil Milton would be 111 years old if he were here today. He was born in 1912. Uh, no, I don't have any questions for David. What's the next question? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, you've covered this a little bit, but I'll put a little finer point on it. I'm wondering if the resolution itself has a little bit of circularity to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, if we're saying that we don't need the NAP to uh, defend libertarianism, um, most of us define libertarianism as, as uh, no one gets a special pass to take my stuff which is sort of another way to say the nap. Like, so, so what is then libertarianism? Or is it just as I think I've heard, merely an infinite array of consequentially optimal policy choices or decisions? Anytime two people interact, there's a chance for conflict. So how does that get solved if not uh, appealing to some deontological principle? Um, it, are we just making every judge a consequentialist calculator? And how do we know that they won't calculate wrong? Well, and the, I mean, in the fact, may, may, look again, libertarianism is—I I imagine most of you know—it's not a philosophy of life. 
It, it, it's, simply, it's simply a key principle that, are, that, that, that tends to inform, for the most part, our attitudes toward government. It's simply the zero aggression principle, as I enunciated. It's got very narrow implications, except, of course, it, when governments start running amok. And, uh, and, and, and uh, while uh, David and I could acknowledge marginal cases in which the, the juries have to decide rather difficult situations, for the most part, the laws against theft, murder, and all the rest of it are very clear and very easy to apply. So I don't think, but but there's no question that in the jury, or in, in the case that David cited, by the way, when he talks about the economics of punishment, the fact of the matter is that in many societies, I think even including this one, uh, if, if you're a murderer and you're, you're a torturer, there is a certain attitude on the part of society that economics is not the only issue, but retribution is. Punishment, just simple retribution for your heinous crime, that could enter as well. But if you're saying that, that, that in any society the application of law is complex, having to, you're absolutely right. But the zero question is it, full stop, nothing else. Right, right. and I guess I was more directing my question to, to Dr. Friedman no, okay. as to how then he defines libertarianism without reference to property rights oh, okay, more yeah. than that. Yeah, yeah I don't... I don't think there is a bright line definition by which you can say so-and-so is a libertarian, so-and-so isn't. Uh, I think libertarians are people who in general are in favor of individuals controlling their own lives, having their property respected, and so forth. They can believe that for any of a variety of different reasons. You could imagine, and I'm sure there exist, Christians who would say, look, if God wanted us to be forced to be virtuous, he would have done it. He gave us free will, therefore you should allow each person, as I put it a very long time ago, to go to, go to hell in his own fashion. You could have an, a utilitarian who said you maximize utility by having a society in which there's very little government and so forth and so on. And you can have various other people. So it seems to me that what makes somebody a libertarian is not the basis of his arguments. It's that he reaches a certain pattern of conclusions. And as I say, it's not a bright line. People will disagree over some conclusions. Some people will say, well, the best we can get is a 95% free society because anything more than that would collapse. Still a libertarian. Uh, maybe a little less libertarian than somebody who thinks you can get 100%. So I guess that would be my, my answer to your question. Uh, we don't have any more time for question and answer. Fortunately, you can actually find these men walking around. So please save your questions and grab them and ask them uh, as they walk around. Uh, we do have time though for the conclusions and for your final vote. So hold off on your vote, not yet, but uh, we will have the five minute summary by David Friedman. Yeah, I wanted First, to say that there is at least one thing that Gene and I, sorry, there is at least one thing that Gene and I clearly agree on, and that is that Pork Fest is better than Freedom Fest. <laughs> I may have missed it, but I don't think anybody here yet has tried to sell me shares in a gold mine. <laughs> and I can't remember any dogs or small children at Freedom Fest. Uh, but that's, that's a digression. Uh, I want to go back to the point that I made briefly in answering a question, which is that the underlying consequentialist argument is not there is nothing a government could conceivably do that would be good. Because there are things governments could conceivably do that would be good. It is that we have no way of setting up institutions in which the good things governments do will have a larger effect than the bad things governments do. And as I say, public choice theory, it seems to me, is really the basis for those, for those arguments. So let me take for a moment the argument about tariffs. I don't know if it occurred to Russ Roberts, but we have a legal system in which the government does impose tariffs. And nonetheless, the bad consequences he describes occur. So what he requires is not merely a legal system in which the government implies tariffs, but in which it always imposes the right tariffs. And in fact, as you may know, the old argument for tariffs, not the one he's making, 
was the infant industry argument. The argument was that a, you could get an industry started because of various reasons that couldn't start itself in the market, and once it was there, you could drop the tariffs and have a prosperous thing. And that's not logically, not impossible economically, though. It requires some additional assumptions. But if you actually think about the politics of it, infant industries don't have any votes. Who has votes? Senile industries. Industries which are declining and need the protection of the government. I, I don't have the time. I could go into the economics of that. There are actually reasons why the benefit to a, a declining industry of having a tariff relative to the costs to people is larger. Uh, similarly, it is logically possible that climate change is a terrible problem which will kill all of us. But if you actually follow the argument, as I've been doing for a long time, you will discover that there is very little evidence for that belief. Indeed, the serious people like the IPCC don't make the catastrophic claims. If you actually look at their numbers, they are talking about making the world a little bit poorer because we don't control climate change. Uh, William Nordhaus, who got a Nobel Prize for his work on that, uh, estimates that the effect of climate change uh, by the end of the century will be to make world GNP a few percent lower. Uh, nonetheless, there are all sorts of, po of, of, of politically profitable things you can do with the claim that climate change is a catastrophe, uh, and they do them. Uh, so, in fact, I mentioned before the case of, uh, uh, of the biofuels program, uh, which was justified for that reason. Gore himself has conceded that part of the reason he pushed it was he was running for president and Iowa has early primaries. Uh, so the basic argument here, it seems to me, is that the institutions of government can, will predictably, not with certainty, but predictably have net bad effects, and you therefore don't want to have government have powers, even though they are powers that under some circumstances have got good effects. So to repeat my basic argument, which is pretty simple, uh, it has two parts. The first is that the claim that you should never initiate coercion has implications nobody believes in. Gene clearly doesn't believe in them. He wants to modify that by saying, well, yes, you actually are allowed to initiate coercion, but then you have to pay whatever damages the courts uh, impose. Uh, well, if I run the courts, uh, that could result in lots of coercion in my favor. Uh, I don't think there is a, a good mechanism uh, for, for, for doing that. Uh, and the second half of the argument is that libertarianism is not only better than socialism or modern liberalism, it's a lot better, and that consequently uh, you don't have to persuade people that it is really important that billionaires have billions of dollars. All you have to do is to point out that they already think it's important that poor, there be fewer poor people and they be better off, and that's the result you get with a laissez-faire society, not the result you get with a welfare state. Thank you. And the summary for the negative, Gene Epson. Uh, please be prepared to vote. Um. Well, well, I guess I guess the the closest David and I had to, to with uh, to, to what maybe you would regard as a semantic issue has to do with his idea about uh, committing a crime. If I commit a crime, it's not a crime. That's the way I would put it. I still committed a crime. Uh, if if I grabbed the flagpole on the way down to save my own life, I still committed a crime. If I steal the equipment uh, in order to save the world, I still committed a crime. So I don't see now. Those examples are rather far fetched. We could we could make the argument that maybe you know bad cases don't make good law or whatever. But I would only submit to you that. Uh, that those are simply crimes potentially committed in extenuating circumstances. Potentially, were the circumstances extenuating or not? And all, for example, apl applies to cases in which you cause somebody's death, but uh, was it intentional? Was it a completely avoidable accident? All of those decisions have to be made. The death was caused. It's an actionable claim. It is a crime. And so I, I guess you have to think, is David right to say, well, if I committed the crime and, and, and say, yes, I would commit the crime, that makes it not a crime? No, it's a crime. 
crime in extenuating circumstances. So that's why I would say, again, the zero aggression principle and the invasion of property rights is indeed absolute. But, but again, uh, as a practical matter, for example, when, uh, when David tried just a moment ago to address Russ Roberts' problem, and David started to say plausibly, well, but Russ, the, the tariffs that are imposed aren't the right tariffs, all the rest of it, I still don't understand why David wouldn't also say to Russ uh, that don't you understand as well that you're penalizing everybody's right, including people of limited means, their right to buy what they want to buy. Why don't you just try to appeal to them, start a website, try to start a Buy American website, uh, uh, to try to appeal to them about the idea to target your problem with respect to these particular communities. That's all done voluntarily. You're violating people's freedom. Please recognize that. That's why our default position is against you. So again, David now would try to argue something else. All of it useful, I suppose. But again, why does David want to do without the crucial role of the zero aggression principle? Beyond that, I guess, oh, climate change. Once again, uh, all, of, all that David said was right about climate change, although ironically, if you actually read up on to the extent to which we even know that carbon dioxide is causing warming, if you read Stephen Koonin, who is a physicist who appointed by Obama, who wrote a book called Unsettled, the, the truth of the matter is we don't even know uh, to what extent uh, carbon dioxide is causing the warming versus other natural factors, especially since the warming trend was, was, was very fast from 1910 to 1940 before carbon dioxide even played a role. So even it's all a mess. But aside from that, can't we try to say, and every once in a while, as in the case of the vaccines, I said to somebody, well, you're forcing people to take a chemical. Yes, I know that you're supposedly saving many more lives. But just recognize that's the one fact we know. Say to the warmongers, you plan to kill more innocent people uh, in order to achieve some goal? That's, again, the zero aggression principle. It keeps coming up. And so my plea to David is harness your brilliant ability uh, to make consequentialist arguments, harness it, and ground it in the zero aggression principle. Every once in a while, we might convince a few people, as indeed uh, I can say personally, some people are convinced of it. Of course, there really are a lot of people who have a tendency to believe in freedom, even when they call themselves progressives. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So it's time for you now to vote. And on the line is the famous Tootsie Roll. And a welcome to the free state from these people living in the authoritarian 49. Second place will only be a welcome to the uh, loser uh, to the free state. From What's the in that freedom. Tootsie Roll? <laughs> <laughs> so please go to SohoVote.com and register your vote. So. The results from you people. Uh, the proposition, the right way to persuade people of libertarianism is by showing them that, that the outcomes are superior by their standards without any resort to the flawed non-aggression principle. So, starting out with yes, that this proposition is right, uh, we started with 28%, and we moved up to 36%. You're supposed to go, ooh. <laughs> For the negative, we started with 32%, but we moved up to 48%. Oh. So the winner of the Tootsie Roll is Gene Epstein. Oh. Oh. Can I shake your hand? 